When the website hitmanforhire.net was set up, everybody assumed it was a joke. Now, like any other business, it boasted that it carried out its work cleanly and efficiently, but in this case, its work was killing people. The site also included an employment section where would-be assassins could sign up and join in an international hitman network. Anne Royston was a 23-year-old mortgage broker based in Los Angeles and she contacted the FBI to tell them a really bizarre story. She said that she had been approached at her office by a man who was about middle-aged with a strange accent and a moustache. The man told her that he had been paid a deposit of $17,000 to carry out a hit on her life. Now, he also showed her a printout of an email and that read, I want her done by a shot to the head. That email was sent by a woman by the name of Marissa Marks. Marissa Marks was the ex-girlfriend of Royston's then boyfriend and she viewed Anne Royston as a love rival and she wanted to get rid of her. Anne Royston told the FBI that the hitman had warned her that there was a contract on her life. But the hitman told her that she reminded him of his own daughter and that he didn't want to carry out the hit. So instead, he came up with a proposal. He suggested that Anne Royston should pay him the balance of the contract, which was about $20,000, and that in return, he would spare her life. Agent Sotelo directed Anne Royston to get into contact with the hitman and over the next few days they monitored phone calls between the two. And then all of a sudden the communication ceased. The FBI assumed that the hitman must have absconded. Now as it turned out he had left the US but unfortunately for him he hadn't gone to a country that had no extradition treaty with the US. Instead, he had flown all the way across the Atlantic to the west of Ireland, where he was planning to carry out another hit. A man and a woman accused of conspiring to murder the woman's former partner and his two sons went on trial today. Sharon Collins allegedly hired a hitman to carry out the killings. The prosecution say that Sharon Collins from Ennis was eager to marry her partner of several years, Pat Howard, a widower and successful Clare businessman. The court heard that Mr Howard did not want this, as he intended his property business based in Ennis to go to his two sons, Robert and Niall. Miss Collins got a proxy marriage certificate over the internet and it's alleged that she then used the net to search for assassins for hire and came across an Egyptian man, Assam Aid. A former poker dealer, he lived in Las Vegas with his wife and ex-wife. The prosecution alleges Miss Collins set up an email account using the alias Lying Eyes and contacted Mr Aid, who used the name Tony Luciano through his Yahoo address, Hitman for Hire. Hitman for Hire replied to Lying Eyes, saying the price for a contract killing was $50,000, but because it would be three birds with one stone, the price was $90,000. Well, Sharon Coote, as she was born, uh, was one of three sisters who grew up on the Kilrush uh, Road in an estate there. She came from a broken home um, and uh, after school uh, she 
went to the NIHE as it was then to study computers. She was just 19 when she married Noel Collins and they had two children, Gary and David. And uh, the marriage didn't last. The couple separated and later, later on they divorced. So she was a separated single mum kind of uh, grafting and uh, always trying to make uh, a quick uh, few quid in terms of investing in a pyramid schemes and, and uh, working part-time jobs where she could. She, she worked for a, a time as an aerobics instructor. She also went into the furniture business and, and worked for a time in a furniture shop and it was there that she met PJ Howard in 1998. She um, had always wanted to be a, a writer and when she wrote one of her letters to the uh, DPP, um, James Hamilton, she described it in very fanciful terms. She said that, um, that when he walked through the door, it was almost like a recollection. Uh, that was how she described it. In other words, that uh, they were meant to be. And within a few months, she moved in with PJ in his plush home, Ballybeck House, on the outskirts of Ennis. And they lived there uh, for some time, uh, right up until her arrest, and then later on her trial. Um, at, the, at the four courts in Dublin. PJ Howard uh, is also from Ennis, but unlike Sharon, he, um, he came from the other end of the spectrum in that his father had set up a car dealership in the 50s with a man called uh, Denny Downs. And so um, by the time PJ was heading up the family firm, um, uh, he took it into property. It's estimated that his wealth stands at about 60 million. He has a string of properties throughout Clare. He owns a palatial house not far outside Ennis. He also has a penthouse apartment on the Costa del Sol and a boat. No, no mortgages to speak of. He also runs the Downs and Howard Property Company in Ennis. And he has two sons, Robert and Niall, who work with him in the business. He's a very shy type of man. He's, he's not a man who courts publicity. And certainly during the trial of Sharon Collins, he did everything he could to, to keep away from the public eye and, and to keep out of, out of view. So he came from the complete other side of the tracks in that he was also uh, separated from his wife and he also had two sons like Sharon around the same age. Um, but unlike uh, Sharon, he was, um, he was living the high life. When Sharon and PJ had been together for a number of years, PJ's former wife died. Now they had been legally separated and she passed away in 2003. So Sharon Collins felt that this paved the way for her to get married to PJ. And so he agreed to uh, marry her. And in 2004, Sharon told friends and family that they were engaged. And then uh, PJ had a meeting with his solicitor and he found out that a, a, a prenup had no standing in Irish law. And so he realised that Sharon, if he married her, would become his next of kin and that his sons wouldn't be entitled to his, his fortune. He and Sharon uh, signed a legal document stating that they were not married and they never would marry. And in 2005, um, PJ's eldest son, Robert, was given a copy of this, confirming that nothing was going to happen to his inheritance. They didn't marry. They went to Sorrento in Italy and while they declare their undying love for each other um, and expressed vows to each other, they didn't get married. They came home, they had a big party for friends, but there was no marriage. Even after this, Sharon went around telling an awful lot of her friends that she was married to PJ. Now he later said he was aware of this, that he didn't have a problem with it because they both privately knew the score. But what he didn't know at the time was that Sharon decided that even this pretense wasn't enough for her. So she did a spot of internet shopping. She went onto a website called proxymarriages.com and she paid a thousand euro to buy a marriage certificate, a proxy marriage certificate from a company in Mexico. Now, whether that would have stood up to legal scrutiny remains to be seen, but it was certainly enough for the passport office here in Ireland and when Sharon handed in this document, she was given a new passport in the name of Sharon Howard. And that really was all the, the groundwork that she needed to do to set up a situation whereby she appeared to be legally PJ's spouse. The evidence will always suggest that PJ Howard treated Sharon very well 
and that they had enjoyed a great time together and um, living the high life at posh parties in Dromolan Castle and um, several holidays over in Spain where he has an apartment and a boat and they had nothing but the best. They enjoyed a lot of foreign holidays together and he had a lovely lakeside home outside Ennis which she enjoyed so she, she really had a, quite a lavish lifestyle and certainly was treated very very well by PJ on the outside. However from listening to Sharon Collins through the through email correspondence she sent to the Jerry Ryan show and to FM uh, she would suggest that um, it mightn't have been as wonderful as all of that. She made a series of accusations about PJ Howard. She claimed that he frequented transvestites that he brought her to swingers clubs while they were in Spain and that he had pressured her to work as a prostitute but that she refused. Well, Sharon Collins' crime involved a complicated plot to hire a hitman and cover her tracks afterwards, but her best laid plans fell apart. Gardy seized her computer several months later and they came across parts of the email that she had sent to the Jerry Ryan show. Now, as it happened, the email was never actually read out, but such was the consternation surrounding it that it was enough for Jerry Ryan and his series producer to be called into the courthouse in July 2008 uh, to, to testify and to, to say that they had not received such an email. Now, it had actually gone through, had gone into the system, ha had arrived in 2FM, but as Jerry Ryan said at the time, they received 2,000 emails a month, and this one obviously got lost somewhere in the ether. Greed was very much at the centre of this case. Sharon Collins wanted to get her hands on PJ Howard's money. During their relationship together, he had uh, given her money on a regular basis. He had employed her as a part-time receptionist, but she wasn't happy with that. She wanted everything. She was aware of how much money he was worth and how much his business was worth. PJ was not a, a very healthy man. He, he did have some health problems, but Sharon Collins wasn't going to wait around for something to happen him. She thought she needed to put a plan in motion to get rid of him. Now, killing PJ would have been one thing, but there was still the thorny issue of her two, his two sons, both of whom stood to inherit his wealth. All the evidence would suggest that Sharon got on very well with PJ's two sons. Their mother had passed on and she had been very close to uh, both Robert and Niall uh, in the aftermath of that. They certainly looked to have a great relationship and they could never have imagined that Behind the, the smiling face of their father's partner was a woman who was actually setting out a plot to kill them. The entire complex operation involving a hitman began on the 2nd of August 2006 Sharon Collins went online and set up an email address. She chose the name lyingeyes98 at yahoo.com and it was an interesting choice of name given that it reflected the Eagles song, the famous song where a young beautiful woman is married to an old man and cheats on him. Um, she also had 98 on it, which was the year that she met PJ. Um, at the same time, she also began a number of internet searches looking for a hitman. She also began looking for details online about inheritance rights, so she was really setting up, trying to find as much information as she possibly could in advance of her plan. She stumbled upon a website called hitman.us, but this turned out to be a t-shirt website, so second time lucky she came across Hitman for Hire. Sharon Collins went on the internet in August 2006 and carried out a number of searches for hitman, hire hitman, how to kill your partner, etc. And she got in contact with the website Hitman for Hire. It was almost comical, the, the cartoon figure that flashed up, sort of a mobster in a trilby and a, a trench coat with a submachine gun under his arm. Anyone who looked at this website would have thought it was a spoof, but Sharon Collins didn't think so. So she got in contact with the man behind the site who called himself Tony Luciano. Now it was a great Italian sounding alias and something that would fit in very well with The Sopranos or an equally entertaining TV show. 
but Tony Luciano was in fact an Egyptian poker dealer called SM Eid. SM Eid was a, a professional poker uh, dealer who was working in the Bellagio uh, in um, Las Vegas. He was about as far removed from an Italian hitman as he could possibly get. He lived there with two wives, uh, his first wife Lisa Eid and then his second wife Teresa Engel. He had a very strange setup. He was under a lot of financial pressure uh, in terms of his mortgage. He was a very dangerous character. Not only did she Google the word hitman, but she also actually uh, sent the man she was trying to contract to kill, PJ and his two sons, uh, emails in which she stated she hoped, you know, they'd have to get rid of the computers and she knew that the, the memory could never be completely erased. Uh, and yet she continued to, um, to plot openly, if you like, on her work computer, on the computer in PJ's house and on a laptop. Um, and so, although she maintained she was innocent and claimed that she'd been set up, how anybody else who had set her up would have had the same interests so that they would have um, gone into her email and deleted her email conveniently as the state barrister put it or looked up Tesco diets. She hadn't fathomed all that into, into, her, uh, into her plan. Over the course of about two weeks, they exchanged several emails. She explained that she wanted to get rid of her husband and that the two sons would have to be collateral damage, that they'd have to be gotten out of the way as well. Sharon was very organised and very methodical. She gave him in-depth directions and details. Um, the directions were good enough to show him where Robert and Niall Howard lived, just outside Ennis. She also gave him details of PJ Howard's house. Contact between them uh, progressed to phone calls. Not only did they discuss uh, money and, um, and exactly plot exactly how the, the murders would take place, she wanted uh, the, the boys poisoned in a pub where they drank, the Greyhound Bar. Sharon wanted, uh, was very specific about how PJ should die. Uh, she wanted him uh, to make it look like he committed suicide because she felt three murders would be too, um, you know, th three deaths in the same family would be too suspicious. She joked uh, in one of the emails that maybe the news that his two sons were dead would be enough to kill him because his heart was so bad. Um, so that, that just gives you an indication of the uh, callousness of the woman. When Sharon Collins was giving SME all the detail that he needed to carry out the hits, she also sent him some photographs. One of them was a picture of her with uh, PJ Howard, and she wrote beside the picture, which she sent to SME, you'll be able to recognise my husband here, and I'm the devil in the red dress. SME wasn't a very competent hitman, so he, like most amateurs, he went online and tried a few search engines to come up with the most effective ways of killing people. One of the more unusual things that he came across was, was how to make a weapon out of toilet parts, but um, he eventually stumbled on the idea of ricin poisoning on the basis that it was relatively easy to make and would cause a very quick death. S. Amid had a price for each head. He said that the, the going rate for a killing was $50,000 and as Sharon wanted three people killed, that should have been a bill of 150000 But the entrepreneurial Mr. Eid decided that he would do a discount and he offered to do the three killings for the sum of $90,000. Now he demanded a down payment, so Sharon sent 15,000 euro to his address at Camden Cove in Las Vegas. She withdrew that from various accounts, the credit union and bank accounts that she had, and she sent that as a down payment um, to SME's home address in Las Vegas.
The problem with FedExing money is that every step of it is tracked, so that's money had to have come from Sharon. When her trail was traced by the Gardaí, they were able to see that she had later gone online and tracked this package to make sure that it had arrived. That sort of sealed the deal, if you like, for the state's case in that not only did she conspire to murder him, but you know, she paid for it to happen. She wanted it to happen. The deal was done in her own mind. When SME received the down payment from Sharon Collins, he immediately went online, ordered some castor beans, and set about collecting all of the ingredients that he needed to make ricin, which is one of the deadliest poisons in the world. Ricin is a natural material. It, it comes from uh, the plant that's used to make uh, castor oil. Uh, this plant's seeds are called castor beans, and those beans are grown on a large scale throughout the, the tropics. The ricin is an extremely toxic material. It's much, much more deadly than cyanide uh, or, or other substances like strychnine. If it goes directly into the bloodstream, then only a very tiny amount is required, uh, something of the order of um, one grain of salt, uh, that amount of material is sufficient to kill an adult human. But this material is quite difficult to detect and often it, the poison cannot be identified in time to treat the patient. Uh, and in many cases it, it's possible, and in some cases at least, people have been killed using ricin and, and the cause has never been identified. The fear is that people can do this in their garage and there are quite a number of cases over the years of extremists of all shades uh, manufacturing ricin, mostly in quite impure form, but nevertheless ricin that was deadly enough to be used as a weapon. Eads' wife, Theresa Engel, also played a part in the criminal trial. She told the court how she'd made the lethal poison ricin with SME at their home uh, in the US before travelling over to Ireland. And she clearly told the jury that the reason was because he'd been directed to do something to kill the three Howard men by Sharon. If ricin is ingested, what tends to happen first of all is uh, vomiting, diarrhea, the blood pressure falls quite dramatically, um, people go into shock, uh, you, you get a massive organ failure, the liver, uh, the kidneys, the spleen all fail and death is slow and very painful and uh, requires three or four days typically before organ failure is so severe that the patient, the person dies. Before Theresa Engel and Esamid um, travelled to Ireland, Theresa Engel was sent to Spain by Esamid and she was to obtain a key for an apartment, PJ Howard's apartment, and this was with a view to organising the logistics behind how PJ would be suddenly pushed, in inverted commas, um, over the balcony of his 14th floor apartment. However, Teresa Engel was, she actually felt quite sick and she got sick while she was in Spain. She, she just uh, returned back to America. Esmeed wasn't happy with that. Then Teresa Engel and a friend, Ashraf Garbia, travelled to Ireland uh, in late August, early September in 2006. Again, to have a look around, to see where the Howards spent their time. But again, they didn't go ahead with the plan um, and it was after this after those two failed trips, both to Spain and to Ennis, that Esamid um, decided himself he would travel over to Ireland with Theresa Engel. In some ways Sharon Collins was extremely naive. I think the world and its mother would know if you were looking for a hitman that the internet and a search engine wouldn't be the first place to look. Everyone who got a chance to see the hitman for hire website would say that it looked 
totally like a spoof, that it could never have been taken seriously, and yet she was taken in by it. So she was an extremely gullible character, and yet parts of her were actually quite sophisticated, and she made very sure to cover her tracks. She had a certain degree of computer proficiency, and she was smart enough to know that her emails to SME would leave a trail so she knew that she had to get rid of all of those computers and in order to, to do that she gave SME enough details so that he could carry out a burglary at the Downs and Howard business premises to get rid of all the vital evidence. Sharon was very worried about uh, all the information that was on computers so she, um, she wanted the computer in the Downs and Howard office um, which was in Westgate Road, uh, Westgate Industrial Park on the Mill Road. She, she wanted rid of that, so she left a key and out for him um, under a brick at her son's house. And she um, also um, uh, gave him the combination for the for the place, how to get in. And so when he got in there, he he, he robbed the laptop and um, some other items. As a poker dealer. Eid was used to seeing luck flip in an instant and fortune change and it probably made him very well equipped to double cross the person who'd contracted him in the first place and to offer the Howards a chance to buy themselves out of the hit. Sharon Collins thought she had done everything she needed to get these three killings carried out, but she didn't realise that SM Eid was planning to double cross her in spectacular fashion. On the night of September 26, 2006, SM Eid began to change his plans. Up until this point, he had been doing exactly what Sharon Collins had asked of him. But at 10.30 p.m. that night, he began to put his own plan in motion. SM Eid phoned Robert Howard and said to him that he had heard Robert had lost a few computers. Now this would have piqued Robert's interest because the family business Downs and Howard had been the subject of a robbery on the previous evening and a laptop had been stolen from the premises. Eid told Robert that he would be at the house within five minutes. Now Robert would have been intrigued by this but he didn't contact the Gardaí and he could never have expected what might have happened next. About five minutes after the phone call, SM Eid and his partner Teresa Engel arrived at Robert and Niall's house. Teresa stayed in the car while Eid went to the door. Robert would have been expecting the call, so he opened the door and Eid introduced himself as Tony. He had in his possession a laptop, which Robert immediately recognised as the one that had been stolen from the Downs and Howard office on the previous evening. So he took the laptop from Eid he gave it to his brother Niall who brought it inside and left it on the kitchen table and while he was there out of sight of Eid, he called the Gardaí and let them know what was happening. Mead told Robert that he was a hired hitman who had been contracted to carry out hits on Robert, Nile, and their dad, PJ. And to back up this extraordinary claim, he also produced a number of documents. And these had details of how to get to Robert and Nile's house in Ennis, how to get to their holiday home in Kilkee, and also directions to PJ's house over on the other side of Ennis. He also had several photographs of PJ, which proved that this wasn't just an idle threat, that he actually had all of the information he needed to carry out the hits. He said he had been paid €130,000 for the job, but that he wanted to reach an agreement with Robert so that he wouldn't have to carry out the hits. He suggested that Robert should pay him €100,000 and in return he would cancel the contracts on their lives. over some photographs to Robert. Robert brought these inside and while he was inside, he contacted Garthi to make sure they were on their way. Mm -hmm. 
when Robert came back to the front door, Ede was heading back towards his car. Robert attempted to follow him, but he later told Garthi he hadn't been able to identify the colour of the car or the licence plate. Later on that night, Ede rang again and he asked Robert had he made a start in collecting the €100,000. Robert lied to him and said that he had started working on it. The laptop that Ede had given Robert had been left on the kitchen table in their home and Robert didn't touch it after that. It stayed there on the table until the following day when Gardi collected it and tested it for fingerprints. Robert was to meet with Essamede at the Queen's Hotel in Ennis. He used Teresa as his bait in, on that occasion and Teresa was sent to the hotel to collect this money. Now, as it happened, no money ever changed hands because Robert Howard had contacted Gardaí and the entire hotel was surrounded. So, although Teresa Engel showed up to get the cash, she left empty-handed and herself and Essamede were later arrested. Sharon was arrested uh, in June 2007 at the home she shared with PJ Howard, Ballybeg House on the Kildarsif Road in Ennis. And she was arrested and she was uh, questioned by Gardaí and she was brought to Kilkee where the district court was sitting that particular Tuesday and there she was charged uh, with conspiracy um, with SME to murder Robert and Niall Howard and she was later charged with soliciting SME to kill the three Howards and the charge of conspiracy to murder PJ Howard was later added. When this story broke initially in 2007 when Sharon Collins was charged, nobody in Ennis could believe that she was guilty of the charges uh, that were brought against her. And people genuinely felt that she was the victim of a setup. She was quite well known in Ennis but people could not believe and even as the, the trial went on day after day, people found it so difficult to believe that she could have been guilty. Sharon Collins maintained her innocence until the very end, but she did admit to certain elements of the plot. She did say that she had written those things about PJ Howard, the details about his sexual indiscretions, but she said that she had never ever contacted any hitman or done anything to cause pain to any of her family. So she came up with this person, Maria Marconi. She said one day when she was on the computer, um, uh, a pop-up email uh, came in asking her if she was interested in um, creative writing and she got in touch with Maria Marconi, who became her writing mentor and who visited her and helped coach her in writing. And she said this is how Maria had access to her computers. Sharon said that through the course of their friendship she had revealed a lot of detail about her and PJ's lives and had confided in her about the so-called lewd, uh, uh, lewd behaviour that PJ Howard engaged in and she claimed that Maria Marconi later contacted her to tell her that her uh, laptop had been stolen and that the information from Sharon Collins's emails had been used by a third party to blackmail her and that Sharon later felt 
having been confronted by this mysterious blackmailer that if she didn't pay up the money that all of the things that she said about PJ Howard in her emails would be used against her. And she said that was why she sent the money via FedEx, the 15,000 uh, euro. This was why she'd sent it to, to cancel this uh, rather than as a deposit um, for killing the three Howards. Because Issa Mead had sent her photographs of himself in a flash yellow sports car, um, she tried to maintain that um, Maria Marconi was somehow linked with Issa Mead because um, uh, she also drove a, a flash yellow sports car and lived in Las Vegas. The Gardaí have and the FBI tried to track down this Maria Marconi and indeed Collins' own legal team tried to, to track down Marconi in the US but no trace of her was ever found. So the prosecution concluded that she was nothing more than a figment of Collins' imagination. Sharon Collins, despite all of her internet contact with SME, had never actually met the man that she hired to carry out the hits. SME uh, was sitting in the courtroom, Sharon Collins was brought in, she was charged at the time with conspiracy to murder um, Robert and Niall Howard. She'd later be charged with conspiracy to murder PJ Howard. That was the very first time they met. In that tiny courtroom uh, over in Kilkee, Essamie sat down, he was flanked by um, two Gardaí or prison officers and winked and said, I was cheated. Sharon Collins claimed she had never set up the lying eyes email address and when her case came to court, she was questioned by the prosecution barrister Unani Rafferty, who said to her that, you know, it was Lying Eyes was obviously the name of the, the famous Eagles song. And she pointed out to Sharon Collins, and she said, this is a case, or this is a very well-known song. This is a song about a young, beautiful woman who marries an older man and who then cheats on him. Surely, Miss Collins, you know what this song is about. And Sharon Collins, even though she was backed into a corner, still wouldn't admit it. And she said, you know, I actually only know the first verse of that song and I'm more into Justin Timberlake myself. During the trial, SME's legal team uh, always maintained that he was a con man and nothing more than a fraudster. However, the manufacturer of the rice and poison at his home in the US and its transportation over to Ireland would suggest otherwise. SME did appear to be a, a very bumbling, inept, criminal who had nothing more on his mind than extorting money from these various people who had been targeted. But the fact that Gardaí were able to find rice and poisoning in his contact lens case suggested that if push came to shove, he was actually prepared to carry out the killings. He might have been an idiot, but he was also a dangerous idiot. I don't think there's any doubt but that Eid would have carried out those hits. I mean, he was brazen enough to uh, go up to the door and tell those men face to face what he was about to do. Uh, nothing was going to stop him getting his hand on that cash. In one of the more bizarre moments of this incredibly bizarre case, uh, Theresa Engel told everyone in court how they had smashed up the castor beans, mixed them with acetone and something else that she couldn't quite remember and had put them through a sieve and waited for the mixture to dry out into a powder. Now this powder was eventually put into SME's contact lens case and brought over to Ireland and it remained unnoticed even after SME was arrested and taken off to prison and uh, it wasn't until FBI agents who were investigating the parallel extortion attempt that had gone on in the United States um, when, when they discovered a little bit of detail about that they began to panic and realised that there was a potential that SME had planned to use ricin in Ireland. So the FBI contacted the Gardaí here and on foot of that, Gardaí brought special agents over to the prison. They checked SME's cell, carried out a detailed search, found his contact lens case and uh, when it showed up traces of ricin poisoning, it was then packed off to a laboratory for further testing and the test confirmed that there was poison in the case. Sharon didn't react with any surprise when PJ walked across the courtroom and kissed her. Everyone else in the court was very surprised. She wasn't. It was almost as if it had been set up between them and it had been agreed. And as a matter of fact, she mouthed thank you to him after he'd given evidence. The, the kiss itself really was compelling and was one of the major talking points in the trial. He'd said so much on her behalf despite all the allegations that were made against her 
and there he was um, showing his actions. He didn't appear for the remainder of the trial. However, at the sentencing hearing, PJ Howard spoke out in her favour and asked the judge not to jail her and said that they, you know, they could take up their life again together as they had enjoyed so much good times together. And he said he just did not believe the allegations. He believed that she was the victim of an elaborate scam. Nobody remembered anything like it. It just was unprecedented. It was unbelievable that somebody who um, could very uh, easily have not been in court because he'd been dead, somebody who was lucky enough to survive this evil plot um, should, should actually believe the most bizarre story that, that, that a, a criminal court has ever heard. A Clare woman has been found guilty of soliciting a man to kill her former partner and conspiracy to murder. 45-year-old Sharon Collins of Kildice of Dunellis was found guilty of trying to hire Las Vegas-based Assam Eid to kill PJ Howard and his two sons. They also found Eid guilty of attempting to extort money with menace. Sharon Collins was eventually found guilty of conspiracy to murder PJ Robert and Niall Howard and also of soliciting SME for the purposes of murdering the three men. It was a very unusual situation in court because um, the jury were drip feeding the uh, results back so uh, there was a lot of confusion as to what she'd been found guilty of and, and what he'd been found guilty of but um, she was absolutely distraught at the result and uh, as were her sons, um, uh, one of them um, looked like he was about to collapse. The jury of eight men and four women found SM Eid guilty of trying to extort €100,000 from Robert Howard to cancel the contracts. He was also found guilty of handling stolen goods, but the jury was unable to agree on a verdict for the conspiracy to murder charges, so Mr Justice Roderick Murphy discharged them. The DPP must now decide whether or not to order a retrial for the conspiracy to murder charges against Issam Eid. In the meantime, he returns to jail to be sentenced along with Sharon Collins in October. Diane Connor, TV3 News at the Central Criminal Court. Now, as it happened, her conviction for conspiracy was later overturned because the jury could not agree that SM Eid had been guilty of conspiracy. And on the basis that you would need two people to conspire to carry out murders, um, she eventually managed to get those convictions overturned. But her conviction for, um, for soliciting a man to kill still stands and she was convicted on three charges in relation, in relation to the three men. Good evening. A woman convicted of conspiring to murder her partner and his two sons has been sentenced to six years in jail. So too has the hitman Sharon Collins tried to hire. This case was every journalist's dream. Not only did it have the glamour factor of the FBI involvement and FBI agents testifying in court, it also had very sinister elements that you wouldn't normally find in an Irish courtroom, such as the recipe for ricin. There were details of sordid sex acts. There was a Las Vegas poker dealer masquerading as a professional hitman. It really was quite intriguing. There was an element of glamour to it all. And as SME's defence barrister pointed out, it was the type of plot that you might think worthy of the Cohen brothers. There were so many incredible angles to this case that it was no surprise that it eventually spawned two books and the rights to it have also been sold, so we may yet see the story of Sharon Collins up on the big screen.